and that state of liberation is called nirvana. So again, nirvana, like samsara, is not a place. It's not like when we achieve liberation, we end up in some alternate reality somewhere else. It's a state of mind. So if we eliminate our distorted view of reality, mental afflictions and suffering, we are now in nirvana. And we looked yesterday at that six steps of how we are stuck in this state of dukkha. We looked at the seed of ignorance, ignorance, misconception, and so forth yesterday. We're going to now then look at this uh, wheel of life, or in Sanskrit called Bhava Chakra. And this is a diagrammatic representation of how we are stuck in samsara, but also how to break free of samsara. And very often, um, if you go to any Tibetan Buddhist temples, you'll find one of these diagrams, drawings, usually very large, on the wall beside the main door. The idea being that anyone passing by who looks at that may hopefully get some uh, idea about that. So it's actually a full teaching. In fact, the history of this diagram is that at the time of the Buddha, after, after he achieved enlightenment, he spent a lot of time in a place called Rajgir. That's where he taught most of these perfection and wisdom teachings. And Rajgir literally means the place of the king. So the king of that region who was living there was King Bimbasara. And he appears in a number of sutras of the Buddha because he was a disciple of the Buddha. And it's said that at one, one time he received a precious gift from a neighbouring king and he wanted to give back something of equal value. And the king didn't really have anything of equal value. So he went to the Buddha and said, uh, what can I give? And then it said that the uh, Buddha commissioned the drawing of this diagram and gave it to him. He said, give this to the other king. This is of much more value than what you received. And it said that the other king studied this and on the basis of that, he achieved liberation, became an arhat. So it might be, might be useful. So let's have a look at the diagram. First off, what we see here is this wheel is being held by a monster here called Yama. Yama is the Lord of Death. So Yama is symbolizing death and impermanence. And you can see that he's actually biting the wheel, which means that literally we are trapped in the jaws of death, that we're stuck in this cycle of birth, aging, death. And so that's the symbolism here of uh, Yama. But we see here that the Buddha has transcended this wheel of existence called samsara. He's outside. And he's pointing over to the other side, to the right. And in a traditional diagram over on the right here in the sky, often you'll see the moon. <clears throat> there is a round object here on the top. It, it, may be the, the, may, it might be the moon, actually, but often you just see the moon there. And remember, the moon is often used as a symbolism for nirvana. And we saw that in that etymology of nirvana yesterday, that one etymology of nirvana was the, the act of are fully cooling, meaning that now we are tormented by the heat of the mental afflictions, just like we get tormented by the heat of the sun. But if we can eliminate the mental afflictions, then our mind is cooled from that. So just like the light of the moon has a cooling effect rather than the heat of the sun, a tormenting effect. So that's the symbolism of Nirvana. Here, in this diagram, we have um, some writing up here. And I think this is a 
Tibetan version of the diagram, so I think it looks a little like a bit like Tibetan writing here. But this uh, writing here um, says the following. And this is, some in, this is actually instructions from the Buddha saying, undertaking this and leaving that, engage in the teaching of the Buddha, like an elephant in a thatch house, destroy the domain of the Lord of Death. Those who with thorough attentiveness practice this Dharma of subduing will eliminate the wheel of birth, bringing suffering to an end. <coughs> So let's have a look at the diagram then. So we'll go right to the middle. And in the middle we see three animals. We see a pig, a rooster and a snake. These three animals are symbolising the three poisons. The three main mental afflictions of ignorance, attachment and aversion. So the pig is symbolising ignorance... The rooster is symbolising attachment and the snake is symbolising aversion. Now, in this particular diagram, you see that each animal is grabbing the tail of the other animal. In a more traditional diagram, you will see that the pig is grabbing both the tail of the rooster and the snake, meaning out of the mouth of ignorance comes attachment and aversion. But here... Um, they're, they're grabbing each other's tail, but that's also okay because each one of those mental afflictions uh, can have, uh, feeds into the others. So this is also okay just to, to have it like this. So remember, these mental afflictions are driving our behaviour, our actions. So that's the next circle out where we see the, the left half is white and the right half is black. So the left half is symbolising the white actions or the virtuous actions. And here we see the, the beings or people in that half are sort of moving in an upward direction. Meaning that if we do virtuous good behaviour, we will figuratively speak, go upward to a better future life. Whereas in the right side... Uh, the beings here are sort of moving in a downward direction and the black is symbolising non-virtuous harmful behaviour. So if we engage in non-virtuous harmful ha behaviour, we will sort of figuratively speaking move downward into not a good future life. And then, of course, what types of existence are possible is the next cycle out, so circle out, so we have here it divided into uh, six sections. But you can see five here. Five. This particular diagram is divided into five, and one. But one of the di one of the sections often is divided into two, and I'll explain why in a minute. Um, so here. We see from up at like from 10 o'clock, uh, from 12 o'clock to 2 o'clock, up this area here, we see some people in some houses doing various activities and so forth. So this is the human realm. And then if we go over sort of from 8 o'clock to 10 o'clock over the left side here, we see some animals, uh, some birds, and down the bottom is, I think there's supposed to be some fish as well. So this is the animal realm. Well. From 8 o'clock to 10 o'clock over the left side here. And then we see from 10 o'clock to 12 o'clock... <laughs> Top left, um, two groups of beings there, um, one sort of a little bit above the other, and they're sort of firing arrows at each other. The group 
<coughs> on the upside, up, up um, this is depicting what's called the Deva realm. And the beings in this realm here um, lead very long lives. Their bodies are not made of flesh and blood and so forth. They sort of have light, energetic bodies. Where? And they enjoy a lot of pleasure. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's called the Deva realm. Sometimes this word Deva is translated as like God realm. But of course, that's nothing to do with the Christian idea of a creator God. God simply in terms of a heavenly experience, a lot of pleasure and hardly any suffering at all. And the other group, the lower part of that section, the beings there is uh, depicting what's called the uh, Asura realm. They also have very long lives, a lot of pleasure and so forth, but not as much as the devas. So therefore this word asura then is sometimes translated as like demigod, like half a god, like half the pleasure. And so the, the asuras are jealous of the devas and that's why they're sort of firing the arrows at them. And you can see that in the middle there's a tree. The base of the tree is in the asura realm but the top of the tree where all the fruit is, is in the Deva realm, meaning the Suras sort of miss out a little bit. So that's why they're jealous and they're sort of firing arrows at the, the Devas. I don't know what you're talking about. I didn't see nothing. <laughs> uh -huh. Please make it more clear. <laughs> <laughs> they look for me like they are fighting. They are because the Asuras are jealous of the Davids. They're firing arrows at them because they're stealing all their fruit. So that's to symbolize that they're of, that's symbolizing jealousy. So remember all this diagram here is symbolic. And then if we go over to the um, from 2 o'clock to 4 o'clock, we have some beings over here uh, looking like they're not having a very good time, some big bellies. Some of them even have a bit of fire coming out of their mouth. Um, this, this is symbolising what's called the Preta realm. And in the Preta realm, uh, the beings there really uh, struggle to even get the basic necessities of life, like food and drink and so forth. And so therefore, this word preta is sometimes translated into English as like hungry spirit or hungry ghost realm to, to symbolise that they have a lot of hunger and thirst and so forth and quite a lot of suffering. And then down the bottom here from like four o'clock, uh, from, from five o'clock to seven o'clock is a lot of flames and torture going on and so forth. This is symbolising what's called the Narak realm. And here in this type of existence, the beings have a lot of suffering, particularly physical suffering. And so hence the word Narak is sometimes translated as hell realm, but of course not the same idea as the Christian idea of hell. So these are the six types of existence that are possible. And then, of course, often the question is, are these actual realms or are they just some sort of psychological state in the human realm? Well, we can confirm at least two of these realms through direct observation. The human realm and the animal realm definitely exist. And uh, some people claim to be able to see these other types of beings. And the Buddhist assertion is that particularly through the shamatha practice, if we really purify our mind, and then in addition, if we can, it, simply doing that, we can start to develop the ability to perceive these types of beings. But certainly, if we purify our mind through the Vipassana practice of emptiness, then we can really develop the ability to perceive these other types of beings. Are they human or not? Okay, so... 
these I, these types of realms, I think we can all relate to, even as a human, that you know sometimes we have immense pleasure, so we we're having a sort of a deva type or a sura type of experience, or a sura particularly jealousy is very dominant there. So we have, definitely have that human we know about. Sometimes we really sort of <laughs> have a bit of a, a not so good experience, like an like an animal, really. You know, and then preta is of course hunger and thirst and so forth. So we can see a lot of that type of suffering going on in the world, and we only have to go to the areas of the world where there's a lot of conflict going on to see there's a lot of uh, people stuck in a bit of a narak type of existence, a lot of uh, immense suffering. So these are certainly something we can relate to as a human, but the assertion here is that they're actual existences. Now. To it's not a state of mind. I'm coming to that right now. Oh, okay. Now, to really appreciate what we mean here, we really have to have some, or to, to understand them in, in a very good way, we have to really appreciate this view of emptiness that we're going to look a little bit on day nine that basically that says there is no objective world out there. That the only world that exists is our world of experience. And if we can really appreciate that, then there's not much difference between saying these are psychological states in the human realm and saying they're actual existences. We're not really saying much difference. The only difference may be that... Um, you know, to be in a deva existence versus we having a deva experience. Maybe the only difference is our deva experience is not so long and the body the body looks a little bit different if we're actually a deva. So they're, they're not... Uh, so to understand that these existences in this way, I think, can be very helpful. But certainly, these types of existences are not types of existences that we can see with this physical eye because the bodies here are more subtle so it could be that there are these sorts of beings right here physically located in this room that's possible and in fact um, on that point about pretas I, I got a story um, when I was doing my first long retreat, and I was in Spain in this retreat centre, I had a hut, and I noticed over on the side of the mountain a bit over, there was another hut looked quite nice, but the whole eight months that I was in retreat, there was no one in that hut. And I thought that was a bit odd, because they're fairly busy there. So at the end of the retreat, I sort of went, I was at the centre, I said, well, how come you're not using that hut over there? And they said, ah, oh, okay. Um, what had happened was, um, I think about a year before, yeah, it was about a year before, there was an old tree stump outside the hut that they decided to get rid of. So there was an old tree stump that they wanted to get rid of, and the story goes that there was a Preta being living in that stump. Preta. And he didn't like it when his house got sort of demolished. So he got a bit upset. I mean, after that time, anyone who came to that hut, this Preta being was quite aggressive. But because it's not, it's, it's a, a light body, it, it depended on the, the state of the mind of the meditator whether that preta could affect them. Mm. So for some people, they didn't notice. Like I had a, a friend I was studying with. She was in that retreat at that time there, and she said she didn't have any problems at all. But over a period of about a year, there was at least six or eight people who was in that hut who really had a lot of difficulties. Like one person reported that the that something was pushing against their chest when they were sort of sleeping. And another one uh, had really like uh, uh, some heavy sort of mental thing happening. There was about six or eight people that really had very strong experiences. 
And so then they thought, well, there's something not right here. And then, um, then a, um, Lama Zopa, who's the head of the FPMT, came and he said, yes, there's a pressure here because he can perceive them. And he tried to pacify this preta and sort of told him, you know, move. And he, he, did, he couldn't. Um, but then at some time later, this preta being sort of moved away. So that, I thought, was an interesting story. <laughs> Can I ask a question? Which uh, retreat center? Uh, this was in a place called Ursuling in Spain, just up in the Sierra Nevada, just outside of Granada. Um, so the question then can be also, which of these six realms is the best realm? And then, of course, to answer that, you'd have to say, by what criteria do you mean best? And if the criteria is most pleasure, least suffering, the, of course the easy winner is Deva, by far, by far the best realm. But if the question is best, meaning from which of those is it best or have we the best possibility of escaping samsara, then the answer usually is human realm. Because in the Deva and Sura realm, there's too much pleasure, not enough suffering, so there's no motivation to do anything. <laughs> and down in the animal, Preta and Narak realm, usually there's too much suffering and often not enough cognitive ability to do anything. Whereas in the human realm, we have enough good conditions, but enough suffering and enough cognitive ability to do something. So we have a good mix here. So often it's said the human realm is the best realm from which to escape samsara. And if you look at it at the, at, as a state of mind, well, I can see it as a state of mind. Well, what I'm saying is that there is nothing but a state of mind, if we understand emptiness. <laughs> there is no objective world out there. Okay. Like, you know, it's not like... Your story was not... Uh, Sorry? Your story, your story about the Preta, it looks like there is an entity. Yes, just like we're an entity, but what I'm saying is that when we, there is no objective world that any of us are experiencing. The world that we experience is a world that's produced by our mind, as we and we get to understand that. So what I'm saying is that, and and why why do we produce this particular world? The Buddhist assertion is is because of our past behaviour, is now ripening for us to produce this world. So if we change our behaviour, we do a lot of bad things, then suddenly our mind is producing a very different world, a preta world. And our body looks different, and our world looks different. So that's the Buddhist assertion. And then, of course, sometimes the question here is then, um, how do you explain that the fact that the human population is increasing on the planet? Well, that's easy, of course, because it, that, what all that means is, at the moment, there are beings from other realms who are moving into the human realm. And if the human population decreases, then they're moving to other realms. Or liberated. Sorry? Or liberated. And also, um, of course, in Buddhist uh, cosmology, there are, there's life on many planets and, of course, multiple universes. So we can add that in as well. <laughs> okay. Let's now have a look at the outer ring, these 12 links, because this is the, the important teaching here in this diagram. So these 12 links, a little bit like those six steps yesterday, describe the process of how we are stuck in samsara due to our ignorance and mental afflictions and how also to break free. So if we go up to uh, sort of 12 o'clock or a little bit 1 o'clock, up here at the top, we see a person with a, a stick. That's a blind person. Can't see where they're going. So like that, we are blinded by ignorance. So this first link is symbolizing ignorance. Again, this ignorance uh, grasping on to independent me, independent world, distorted view of reality. And due to that ignorance, that is driving out, creating mental afflictions, and that's driving our behavior. And that's link two. Link two here, 
we see is a, uh, a potter on a potter's wheel. So a, a person with a clay that's spinning and he's forming a pot. Potter. Artist, someone who makes clay pots on a wheel. A potter in English it's called. A, po a potter, is there a word for potter in Hebrew? Potter, someone who makes pots? Okay, there we go. That one. one of those. So the symbolism here, the symbolism here is that this is symbolizing our actions. Because depending on what actions we do now, that is literally forming what our future life is going to look like. So that's the symbolism of forming the pot. So if we do good actions now, that's forming a good future. If we do bad actions now, that's forming not such a good future. Karma. Yeah, action is karma, yes. And then the third link is consciousness, and that's symbolised here. You can see a monkey in front of a house um, and that house normally would have uh, five windows and a door and they are the five sense faculties and the mental faculty and the monkey here is jumping from one window to another and to the door jumping all around so here sometimes we hear this uh, analogy the crazy monkey mind that our mind is jumping all over visual thinking everywhere, crazy. Uh -huh. So that's that's mind or consciousness. So every action we do is imprinted on our consciousness, our mind. And then one of those actions that is imprinted on our mind will then ripen as the next existence. And the process we'll talk about later in the 12 links but when that imprint ripens as a new existence, that is link four, here called name and form. And that's symbolised here by a boat with some people in it. And the boat is symbolising the body, and the people in the boat is symbolising the mind. So the, the body is the vessel for the mind. Mm -hmm. And so that's symbolizing the um, when the mind comes together with the body. So the what happens here is that to add a bit more information is that when we go through the death process then one uh, imprint gets activated which is going to determine what the next life is going to look like and then after this life finishes there's a, a period between this life and the next life called the bardo in Tibetan or the intermediate period where the person who dies that consciousness takes on a physical form and is now what's called a bardo being, and that being is programmed to find conditions suitable uh, to be reborn according to that imprint. Now, that bardo being, because it has a subtle body and subtle mind, has a lot of uh, ability of the mind. And normally the bardo being can actually see where they were just previously in the previous life and see everything that's going on. Even to the point where sometimes the bardo being doesn't realise they've, that they've just died and they're there and they're wondering why no one's talking to them. I think there was a movie with Bruce Willis, The Sixth Sense where he died and he was in the bardo, but no one, he was trying to talk to people, but no one could communicate with him. Sorry? Yeah. So that can actually happen. Um, and, but at some time, the bardo being will realise they've moved on and they're in the bardo, 
but then they're programmed to find a suitable existence according to the imprint that was activated, 